have a view about how we try to understand a variety of, uh, uh, I don't like the term, complex systems, uh, so made of many elements which are dynamical and give rise to the emergence of patterns of different behavior. And of course, financial markets are extremely rich in data and it has led us to study these systems to try to quantify some, an elusive quantity, which is how much is there of uh, self-fulfilling prophecies, how much is there of the fact that uh, people make decisions not based on real information or external information, as the STEM theory would uh, teach for our students, but actually on past actions, which are therefore giving rise to some, they say, pseudo information to the future decision and so on. Uh, it is also resonating with the concept of reflexivity, famously uh, marketed, I would say, by George Soros, uh, the famous philanthropist and, and financier, uh, who has written this book on reflexivity, pointing out that he made his fortune essentially playing this kind of behavior in stock markets, namely not trying to actually uh, for, uh, run uh, the way news would be incorporated in market, but actually trying to guess what others would be doing and also how past actions of the market, past, past behavior of the markets were was predicting of future markets. So today I, I'm trying to bring a little bit of quantification to these questions. And for this, I'm going to borrow concepts and uh, uh, let's say analogies from a variety of fields, from earthquake physics, from finance, from, uh, from um, sociology, social networks, and more. So, okay, uh, don't hesitate to, to ask and to stop if the talk is interactive, it would be much better. And I have a subtitle which is a bit different because uh, when we were discussing about what I should speak, uh, there was an hesitation between the two, and then at the end we decided to speak about both. So we'll see if I can speak a little bit about the, the, the real time financial crisis observatory that we are currently running and how it works. But the first part will be on the endogeneity. So to summarize, how financial market works? Well, the standard view is we have news, news in the sense of informative about the future cash flows, let's say, about the company, and this should be reflecting the price, which are somehow the discounted uh, accepted value of future cash flows. For example, the value of your house should be, in principle, after deduction of all taxes and expenses and so on, the discounted value of the rents that you could get by running it, and that's the rational pricing of uh, any, um, any quantity. Now, you have, uh, and I'm going to apologize because I have to go quite, quite fast on this very deep concept, something that has evolved from uh, this idea of the news transformed into price by the engine of the market, which leads to the concept of efficient market hypothesis, uh, which, by the way, was rewarded this year by another prize in economics, uh, to Fama, Jane Fama. Uh, which is essentially say that the market, because of the incentive of participants to uh, arbitrage any abnormalities, then lead to a kind of fixed point, dynamical fixed points, stochastic fixed points, where the market is very efficient and captures all the news or the information, so that it's extremely difficult without taking risk to uh, make money. And you have. Uh, okay. And you have, uh, I would put it just to have a kind of counterparty of the argument, there are more subtle uh, degrees of shade, of course. The reflexivity view of the market is that actually, and Soros uh, has been quite vocal, for example, on the, in, on the uh, um, professional circles, to point out the role of feedback loops, of endogeneity, of reflexivity, and so on, and by uh, downgrading, some sense, the importance of external information. And the big question is, Certainly, this story has a lot for it, has been tested a lot in the 60s, 70s, and so on, has been criticized in the academic circle, it's hotly debated. We know that for sure that the precise uh, textbook definition of efficient market is not really what it is, but it's a, maybe a good first uh, order approximation. We also have a lot of evidence that there are problems uh, with the efficient market hypothesis, and there is some support on the idea that there are uh, deviations and maybe that indeed there is a level of endogeneity and reflexivity. But the question is how can we make a, um, uh, some progress in these questions and say that to look at the difference. So uh, first let's go through very briefly uh, through a few anomalies of the efficient market view. 
uh, one most famous one uh, by, uh, noticed by Schiller in particular and others uh, is called the excess volatility puzzle and I think it's part of his Nobel Prize also the jointly uh, obtained with Fama this year uh, showing here, summarized by this graph, showing as a form of time the historical volatility of the one of the US index in black line and the model estimate of what should be the fluctuation of the price if, let's say, the price were, in the sense, rationally priced. And you see a big difference. So there's much more viability than you would expect just from looking at the viability of the dividends, let's say, and the viability of the uh, discount rate. So this is, this is a puzzle. This is something that uh, the theory is this, it ha has a problem explaining the observation. So I put into this picture the exposed rational value of the American stock exchange declined from 1870 to 1970. No, no, it's the mean. It's the mean, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so excuse me, I, I cannot give all the details for this. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I will. Yeah. Uh, so, the, the, so the, 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 the best message. The second, uh, there are many observations of problems. Another one, for example, uh, in a quite famous paper uh, in 1987, the year of the Great Crash, by the way, which is another abnormality, because Great Crash should not occur <coughs> out of the blue only upon the receipt of a significant piece of information that lead investors to reassess their uh, expectation, the value of the company they invested in. And for example, for the October 1987 crash, um, I mean, many studies have been done and has been inconclusive as to what were the causes. There are many, many causes that have been invoked, invoked in hindsight, ex post, which are very difficult. I mean, the best exp explanation I've seen is by Richard Wall, who said the cause of the crash in the US is because the world has crashed globally. That's a factor <coughs> explanation. which doesn't explain why the world has crashed, by the way. So here you have another observation, which is uh, mapping the uh, largest, so you may probably cannot read from the back, but this is, these are until 1986 or something like the largest move in stock market, the SP500, uh, so in a negative side, so you have, the, for example, the one-day loss of 20.5% on October 19, and so on. Oh, yeah, plus, minus, plus, also the large one. And on the right, you have the New York Times explanation. Okay, so this is, of course, <coughs> complete and so on, but this was an attempt to say, well, are the price moves, which are significant in amplitude, associated with a significant piece of news? And the conclusion of this and other studies which are um, amplified by, uh, for example, using the large data set that you can have, for example, by um, a provider like Rutgers, and also the high frequency uh, uh, recording of price. Now it can be at the, at the millisecond or less. The main point is that there is very little connection between big price moves and news. And this data shows the following. Let me explain because it's quite interesting. It shows the frequency normalized, the kind of uh, estimation of the probability for a jump to occur. So there is a definition of a jump that I can go into detail. Condition on the fact that a news has occurred on this database, which and you have uh, the issue of filtering the news and so on, so that it can be relevant to the corresponding stock, which has been done in this paper. And what you, you see in red is somehow what we could call the response function to a piece of news that impact the market, impact the investors, and how the price corresponded change in the future. Instantaneously, you see the peak here, this is the delay of the price moves when at time zero a news piece of news uh, occurs. And you see that only indeed the signal is uh, flat, then there's a reaction, so the causality, and then a kind of response function with the memory, which is case. But it's quite interesting to compare with the black line, which shows the same result when the conditioning of the future jump, the future significant price variation, um, is now on not a piece of news, but a previous jump. Okay. And what you see here is a very interesting structure. First, the likelihood or the frequency of such jumps, uh, such conditional uh, events are larger, but mainly 
the decay of, and I will come back to that after a number of slides, after I've given you the, the background to understand this, decay slower. There's a larger memory, and also there's a kind of precursor behavior. There's a kind of, we could call it triggering behavior. So past jumps actually promote the triggering of future jumps, while here you see really the asymmetric causality for the news to jumps. So I would like to understand this and to quantify the relative importance of these two process. Past jumps triggering future jumps is, could be called endogeneity. Uh, fast news triggering price jumps is more exogeneity, huh? in the sense of external information impacting the uh, reassessment or the valuation. So this question actually arises widely, not just in finance. We have actually, before we were looking at this in the financial domain, we started to work on a series of applications. <coughs> For example, one of them I will briefly mention is the dynamics of success as quantified on YouTube. Uh, YouTube, you know, you put a video on YouTube, you share with friends, and some of them become viral. Uh, the most famous one has been viewed by 1.2 by, by billion, for example. Uh, and some, most of them, are viewed only by a few, a few persons and so on. So the question is, can you understand the dynamics of these views uh, as a proxy of a success of a product? The same question, of course, applies to the movie industry. Can you see a tech series, an evolution by which um, they say there is endogeneity in the process of fame or exogeneity? for example, proxied by an advertisement or something like this. So, this phenomenon of an asymmetry of the response function to a new piece of information that comes in, be it endogenous or exogenous, can be found all over the place. This is the simplest case. Here I can show using uh, the modern internet, where I use Google, uh, uh, providing the Google trend, where you can, for example, type tsunami, and you see at the front of time, very little interest in them, and then the response to the Asian tsunami that occurred in 20, uh, 26 of December 2004, and then the response function, the decay of the memory, the decay of the interest, which is, of course, reflecting all the social activity, the media, and so on, also, of course. And you have other examples where you have more symmetric behavior, especially for, for the, in this case, I take the early uh, Harry Potter's book. Actually, the first Harry Potter book was not the media that we all know was actually a word of mouth effect through children who adopted it. It was published a few thousand samples initially and it grew as a phenomenon by word of mouth, which is for me the mechanism, of <coughs> one of the mechanisms of endogeneity, right? Because you, you see the process endogenously propagated. And this type of response function are all over the place. Uh, this is an example for books where you see in blue. The time series of sales as uh, obtained by, from Amazon, responding to an advertisement in the form of a, a very positive comment by a journalist in the New York Times, the number of sales skyrocket by a factor almost 100, and then relaxes through kind of memory function, um, which can be shown to be approximately a parallel. You find parallels everywhere in time in this. You can see YouTube videos after a pick, could be an advertisement decays. And you have cases where actually the growth is symmetric, more like word of mouth, financial market after the volatility, implied volatility after a crash, or also in the way the media newspapers refer to political events after some political shocks, and so on and so forth. So for example, uh, you have these data, I was mentioning Amazon, you have uh, the post of the list, the list of the rank and the ranking of all the books, in particular, on a daily basis, you have the data you can recuperate. And I started to be interested in this when my book was published. It was published uh, in uh, early January 2003. And um, the whole research domain that I'm going to present to you today is based on this single observation that my book jumped over just a few days from rank in the tens of thousands, which you expect when you have a new book, yeah, to rank five, just behind Harry Potter, and so on. So it was great excitement as an author to see this. And uh, I remember the, the few days before, I saw the rank jumping to 400, that's already great. Then uh, 20, then a few hours later, 7, then a few hours later, 5. So we are glued to the screen saying, what is this activity? And of course, what happened is, unfortunately, and you are going to understand the word unfortunately later on, 
it was an exo, it was an exo de shock. In the sense that I gave an interview a month before that was published just a few days here, uh, uh, around January 17, through this channel with millions of subscribers. So you had this uh, cohort, this herd of subscribers, just buying massively my book on Amazon over a very short period of time. And unfortunately, I don't have the data because I started the project afterwards. But you, basically what happened is my book followed this type of dynamics. An exoshock, a massive advertisement, followed by the first few verse, and then the resonating by word of mouth a little bit, but then decaying. What you would like, really, if you want to market a product, is to have find a, a quality which goes through the green curve, which is another book which has been not advertised, was unknown, but word of mouth started, grew the sales to a peak, and then the decay was slow. You can actually show that the decay was much slower. So um, I get inspiration here from a famous theorem in physics, for me, which is one of the deepest, which is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem or the fluctuation susceptibility theorem. And it says the following, it says that, and it's very general, it can be extended to many other systems, you don't need to uh, look at the physical system, it essentially says that under condition, and we can discuss privately what they are and so on, it's a very interesting domain of research to extend what I'm going to say to auto equilibrium system, heterogeneous system, and so on. Um, the statement is the following, that there is a deep relationship between the uh, intrinsic, I would say, endogenous fluctuation of the system left to itself, can be characterized by correlation functions and so on, and so on, and so on, spectra and things like that, with how the system will react under an exogenous shock. The response function can be linked one-to-one -to, -one to the correlation function of the intrinsic fluctuation left by itself. And this is a very intuitive um, result. Indeed, any system, if I subject it to a shock, the way it replies to the shock and it should reveal a bit of its internal uh, structure and dynamics. Okay? But it can be formulated theoretically rigorously under certain circumstances. And the big question I would like to ask is, is it possible to actually extend this to finance, to the social network, to book sales, and things like that? I'm going to show how it works and how we were able to actually extend this uh, fluctuation susceptibility theorem, showing a deep relationship in the response function to an exoshock with the dynamics, the, the dynamics in an annual shock. And then I will go to, back to finance to show how it helps understanding this initial question that I asked in my seminar. So in order to do this, I'm go, I, I need, and necessarily I need to, uh, to be superficial with respect to time, to disentangle a little bit three components of the question when I'm looking at the dynamics I've, I've been showing. I need to look at the occurrence of individuals and then I need to uh, somehow aggregate this individual decision of buying the book or investing in a market. And I'm going to use a class of branching processes to account for this word of mouth, this click of mouses, thinking of the sociology of this as people influen influencing its owner uh, through a kind of branching, generalized branching process. And of course, we want also to look at the nature of births, whether they are very sharp, very abrupt, or much more spread. So these are the things that we will need to uh, model. And so I'm going to be, of course, quite concise in this. And there is a, a nice uh, connection with a totally different field, which, which is seismology, or physical earthquakes. And this is um, a time series, and this is the model that I'm going to use also for all these applications, which is common. So you see here the rate, seismic rate activity per day. Uh, on the top, and the daily volatility of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And what, so the two time series were very similar. They are not exactly the same. There are, of course, differences in their intrinsic properties. But the most important property which they share is intermittency. And you call it, it's called burstiness. Uh, uh, closeness of burst and then periods of calm and so on. Of course, in the domain of finance, there is enormous industry both professional and academic, to measure this burstiness in volatility and to make models like the famous Arch, Gauss model, and so on. And in earthquake physics, of course, this burstiness means <coughs> that there are four shocks, main shocks, and aftershocks. And many main shocks and aftershocks. So, for example, a magnitude 7 earthquake will typically, typically trigger 
10,000 or more detectable earthquakes above the detection threshold. And you see actually the burst here in this. And the, I'm sorry, and the model on that has been used, um, and to my knowledge, first to model the first time series of the earthquakes, and more recently to model financial time series, and many others, like credit default and so on, cascades, is the class of models which is called the set excited conditional Poisson process. So it's a Poisson process because we deal with jumps or with point processes. In physics, it's called shock noise. So there are three terms, huh? jumps for in finance, uh, point process in mathematics, and shock noise in physics for the same idea. But the idea is that you take into account of the fact that past jumps, past events, can influence the future. Okay, and this is simply written in the following way. This is the type of equation I will be showing only, very few, where you look at the intensity of the personal process, which is nothing but the probability density for an event to occur between t and t plus dt, which is due to an exogenous contribution mu. That could be, for example, plate tectonics moving the plates, or it could be the flux of news in the case of finance, or advertisement, and something like that in the case of social networks. And this second term is more the endogenous part. It is the sum of our old past event that preceded the present time I'm interested to look at, and a sum over weighted by this memory function. There is a memory of how a past event may trigger a future event. In earthquake physics, this is called the Omori law, a very famous power of distribution. And it's maybe a function of the time difference between the uh, source and the target. Maybe marks in earthquakes that are coming called magnitude, in finance could be the amplitude of the jump, and maybe distance or uh, other dimensions if you have a more complicated structure. So this is called the hoax self-excited conditional person process, because of course the uh, present intensity, so the probability for next event, is a condition conditioning on the past. It's past, past dependent, um, and it also, other, in other words, means that the past in front of the future, trigger the future. Now, this model is uh, very, so, yeah, so, for example, we can think of this model in different ways, for example, external force news, and so on, and social influence, so news and social influence. Now, um, this is, I ju with just this stating words, you can show it very easily, easily, to show that this model, which a priori, when you look at the equation here, you think, that is very complicated because all the past influence the present. <coughs> so at any time, if you were to simulate that on a computer, you need to sum this again uh, because time goes on uh, and take the sum of all contributions of the past to calculate when is the most probable time of the next event. It turns out that this is not so. This is, an, this is true, but there is an equivalent formulation in terms of independent branches. And I show you first the, the intuition of the mathematics behind it. It's simply the, because you have a lambda, which is a sum of terms. Now, if you think of sums of superposition of Poisson processes, we know it's still uh, a Poisson process. So we can look at the whole model as a superposition of independent Poisson process with the rates which can be decomposed in each term of the sum. And in a sense, the theorem to prove this, which is an exact, you can prove that the Hoax process can be mapped onto or a superposition of branching process exactly is nothing but relying on the identity exponential of x plus y equals exponential x times exponential y. And because you have Poisson process to calculate the probability by exponential in the lambda, and the lambda is additive. So, yeah, and this is very useful because you can accelerate the, 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 the simulation from n squared cos to n squared, n squared, n proportion to linear. In the, in, the, in the number of events that you want to generate. So this is illustrated in the following way. You generate, you can see the view where you have ancestors, which are these isolated points here, which correspond to the immigrants in the branching process terminology. They correspond to news, to the exogenous uh, intrusion, and uh, they trigger the cascades through first generation, second generation, third generation, and so on. And you have the mix of the two. And of course, what you observe is just this time series, and you have lost the information on the specific, specific branching. So you can have this view that this event could be through this specific genealogy with a certain probability. The full picture corresponds to look at this as 
resulting from a weighted probability of all possible scenarios of this branching superposition. But of course, another view is just saying that all the past influence this set, and they are completely equivalent, but they are very, the, the, those two point of view are complementary and interesting. And the next thing I need to just uh, tell you in order to understand the, the, what I need to, to, to my, my, the result that I want to present is where this model has actually a critical point of bifurcation, a phase transition, whatever you name it, and there is a control parameter which is called the branching ratio. It is defined as the average number of daughters per mother. So uh, it is, of course, associated with the expectation of this memory function. And if less than one equals to one or larger than one, you have these three regimes where when the number of daughters is less than one, it's like a sub subcritical nuclear plant, dies out by itself. If it's equal to one, it's critical. That's what the nuclear plants are functioning at. One neutron is emitted with an effective uh, cross section to continue the reaction just at the margin. And then, other than one, this is an explosive bond where you have more daughters than the mothers. And then the system multiplies like one, two, four, eight, and it goes to infinity. And so the question, uh, and the next point is that this control parameter has another meaning, which is very interesting now for the initial question I was asking. You can show, and this is uh, just written here, that actually n is not only the number of first generation daughter by mother, it is also the fraction of all triggered events to all events in the system. So it's a direct quantification of the level of endogeneity. So you look at, let's say, earthquakes, and you say, how many of them, how, what is the fraction of aftershocks? And what is the fraction of main shocks? n gives you exactly this. n would be the fraction of aftershocks over the total number of earthquakes that you observe. If I am able to calculate n for finance, n will be the fraction of jumps or events I'm looking at, which are resulting from previous events as opposed to um, being, uh, let's say, led uh, by some exogenous news. And the way to prove it in, is very easy. You just show that if there is an exogenous uh, uh, influence mu, the number, average number of daughters, when n is less than 1, is just n then these daughters themselves will create daughters of themselves of number average n, therefore the total number of number is n squared, and so on. We're just finishing the sentence. So then you have this series, n plus n squared plus n three, etc. You sum it, and this is the number of all, uh, of the rate, if you like, of all the events that are triggered, just finishing. Adding now the rate, which is due to exogenating mu, so you just add mu, you get this, and you take the ratio, and all the time cancel except n. So n is directly the fraction of energy in the system. Yes. And yeah, it does not depend uh, from the threshold you choose. Exactly. Th threshold of detection. Yeah, let's talk about the earthquake. Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot. Oh, yeah, okay, no worries. Yes, yes. Also, I, I have okay. written several papers on this. They are, it's a very, for example, in the ITAS, uh, in the OX process, when you calibrate it to the earthquake data, uh, because you have this. Um, magnitude marks and there is a fertility, so a big earthquake is much more fertile in trigger aftershocks of excited earthquake. Yeah, so yeah. one. You need to, so there's a subtlety here, you need a, what you call a ultraviolet cutoff. You need a minimum earthquakes below which you have no fertility. And the problem is that this minimum earthquakes is not the same as the threshold for observation. So what you observe is an N apparent and the n apparent is a lower bound to the true n, you can show. And then you can study how you buy better instrumentation and so on. So there's a big issue, of course, that in general you are not able to measure the true n. And you can argue whether it's a lower bound, a upper bound that you're measuring, what are the type of bias, etc. I will come back to this a bit, but it's a very good question. But in principle, I think it's a very interesting concept to think about and to do. So we have the background intensity, the self excitation. And by the way, you know, the previous calculation showed that if you have a rate mu of news, of, you know, of um, tectonics, or what, of, of uh, external perturbation, by the sum, summation of all cascades, the activity that you observe is renormalized to mu times 1 divided by 1 over n. And you see already a signature of criticality when n goes to 1, the observed uh, activity goes to. Uh, infinity and by the way this is nothing but the translation that n plus n squared plus n squared etc goes to infinity when n 
equals to 1, that's just the, the product property of the summation of the series. But it's very interesting that the activity we observe may be a superposition or entanglement between some weak exogenous influence renormalized up by a lot of endogenate. And that's what we would like to, to quantify. And by the way, in the last few years, there's been a growing interest in this um, type of model, the OX self excited point process, with, of course, application to modeling high frequency price dynamics. That's what I will, I will focus on now, from now on. And um, yeah, all of the construction, critical events, and so on. And also, as I already mentioned, the idea that uh, firms are linked in a network of influence and, for example, create the default of a firm in a network might actually cascade through the influence of this uh, default on all the firms. And this model has been used uh, quite successfully. So, uh, I was mentioning the fluctuation susceptibility theorem. Now we have, I have the, the tools to combine the two. I am showing the uh, response function. When, so, it, at the top, you look at the average equation of this OX process. So, I look at the um, statistical average, I call it the activity, if you like. The first term, eta, is this endogen, exogenous part. And now I've normalized the memory function phi so that the end, the branching ratio, goes out. Huh? So, and this can be called the bare memory because this is the influence of a mother towards its generating power of daughters, of first generation. So the problem with this equation, which is just an equation for the first moment that you write for this process, is that you have known, you have the unknown A of t on the left hand side, and you have also the unknown on the Right hand side. By the way, do you have a stick somewhere, maybe, for me? To, or, no? Okay. So, you have the unknown both sides, but it's a linear <coughs> table equation. You can solve it by Laplace transform or whatever. And you find that the activity, the first moment, the average activity, is a function of the eta, the exogenous flux. Which one? Voila. Very good. So, this is the exogenous flux. So, when you solve this equation, by that class uh, operators, you find the activity, on average, is due to the instantaneous um, effect of the news, and plus the fact of the impact of all past news mediated to the present by a renormalized memory kernel, which take into account what, of course, the, the, the sum of all generation. But of course, the past external news may have influenced immediately some action, uh, which itself triggers future actions through this self excitation. And when you solve over all generation, you get a new memory function, which is <coughs> encompassing all this. And the point is that you can show that if the bare function, the bare memory, is just a power law with the exponent larger than 1, and we show you that theta is close to 0.5 in general, then you can show that if you are close to criticality, which we find in many systems, for reason we don't fully understand, uh, we can debate about this later. We understand a little bit, but then we can show that all the generation play a very important role. And as a uh, what do you want to do? Interesting. There's been a phase transition. A change of resolution. Interesting. Oh. Right. <coughs> if you have been using the remote control, yes. <coughs> maybe you have to press some button again, whichever. Uh -huh. okay. Yes, okay. I just. Uh, yeah, but you have a remote just, control for the beam, yeah, so yes, so it's very like careful yeah. just to have one button. It's okay. okay, so uh, where was I? I was here. So. <coughs> The main point I was, uh, what I was making here is that when the critical, the branching ratio n is close to 1, so the degree of endogeneity is close to 1, when the number of daughters per mother is close to 1, then this memory, the impact of previous exogenous news to the present, decays with a long memory in a technical sense of the term, because the expanding that than 1 is not summable, except for, of course, there will always be some truncation and so on. So there is a beautiful relationship between the bare response, I could call it the exogenous response, to the uh, renormalized response. And you can show that when you just look at peaks of activity of A, independent of any jump of the news, 
then the symmetric behavior we're showing is decaying even slower. So here, this is a new incarnation, if you like, of the fluctuation susceptibility theorem that links the shape of the response function to an exogenous shock to the spontaneous formation of peaks in an exogenous <laughs> way and the nature of the relaxation on both sides, which is symmetric. So you can show it's not difficult, I and mean, mathematics is not too difficult. And this is actually a piece of more quantitative data showing in a variety of systems, YouTube, um, book sales, computer worms, web visitation, music sales, activity, uh, so what is this, yes, uh, newspapers and so on, and, and uh, implied volatility, such queries. You have this process where after a piece of news, a shock, etc., the activity jumps brutally and then decays, and this decay is very well approximated by the power law, 1 over t to the power 1 plus theta, where theta is in the range of 0.4, 0.5. By the way, the factor, the exponent 3, 3 half has theoretical reasons, which you can derive from the models of um, priority queuing and management of scarce resources, which is the time and the prioritization of tasks and so on. That's another story. And we find in the data that everywhere, and not us and others who have used all this data, have found that they use a generic power law with a fast decay, much faster than exponential, and then a long tail. Fast decay and then very long tail. That's uh, typical of uh, power law. And for example, in the case of YouTube, we have in my group uh, recorded the activity of something like 10 million videos. And we're able to do a massive large scale study of this with automatic, of course, method of calibrating these curves and with very good goodness of fit. And so we could really establish by uh, with this large database the existence of this power. So, to summarize, if you have an exoshock, we have the underlying social uh, agent networks of interactions. Uh, if the uh, critical, uh, so <coughs> the branching ratio n is small, basically only the people which are exposed to this piece of information will act because they will not stand to speak to others and you see revealing the activity after the shock is this bear, what I was showing, this bear <coughs> operator here, which is uh, documented and for theoretical reason also close to 1 over t to the power of 3 half. Now if you have a criticality, so namely many generations can be triggered, not only first viewers, but they speak to their friends, who speak to their friends, and so on. Then you have this renormalization with a much slower exponent. And this, for example, can be observed and obtained by numerical simulation of this model. Very nice, where you see the bare response function, 1 over t to the power 1 plus theta. And this is what you see at all the cascade of triggering. You have a much longer tail with much more intermittency and so on uh, and so forth. And you have the endogenous. I would say critical behavior where we look at the most probable trajectory of the activity, condition of the fact that there is no special exogenous events, but you see a, a peaks and then you do, and empirically what we would do is to select the peaks above the threshold, stack them, do an average, and look at the, the behavior and compare with the theory, which for example works very well for YouTube. So we have this type of behavior where it can be characterized by a two by two matrix. The nature of the uh, shock, or the peak, if you like, endogenous versus exogenous, and the nature of the, um, yeah, the, the precursory behavior, uh, which is only uh, existent for the endogenic case. Of course, there's causality in the case when there's an exogenous event. The system cannot know that the news is going to happen, otherwise it will not be exogenous. And you have the nature of the decay after the peak, which is also of a different type of exponent, given with the exogeneity or the endogeneity of the, of, the, of the process. And so we have also no other, and we're not going to detail for the sake of time, other measures of what is the fraction, let's say, of the peaks, which is of, of the activity, which is called to the peak, and so on, and it correlates extremely well with this different time behavior. Coming back to the books, this can really be documented quantitatively. The database is not enormous. Uh, for books which exhibit this type of piece and so on, we found that in the last in the 10,000 highest rank on Amazon, only a few hundred, so the statistics only a few hundred. But still, we see very clearly here the log log time scale after a peak, and you find uh, a critical exo decay, 1 over 2 to the power 1 minus theta, so the renormalized um, 
function, memory function. But you see, in the case of endogenous uh, peaks, the decay uh, in green is much lower and is compatible with this prediction, theoretical prediction, one minus two theta, that you can derive by something around. But also, the precursory behavior before the peak in this endogenous peak is also uh, obeying the predictive behavior. And of course, uh, what we did is we just turned on the side the, the time axis so that we could superimpose what was happening before the, the, the peaks and after the peak. And of course, before the uh, so-called exogenous cross, what is before, uh, before the peak is uh, to the within the resolution here, taking a daily scale, indistinguishable from a direct peak. For the same thing for the YouTube data, where here you had millions of, um, of data, of, of, of dynamics, where we could also show that the mode of the distribution of exponents uh, of the time relaxation cluster around three values, one minus theta, one minus theta, and one plus theta. So you have just one adjustable parameter to uh, make sense of the uh, decay function around shocks, and they are perfectly compatible, and we have made many other tests to check actually the content of the videos and the dynamic of the process and so on. So it's, uh, to me, a quite remarkable um, results that we are starting to be able to quantify the dynamics and by this way, characterizing the level of criticality of this network and the nature even of the shocks and also the quality of the uh, carrier, for example, the uh, YouTube video of a movie, we have also worked on movies, on the quality of movies, that the dynamic signature reveals actually the quality of the movie with respect to the uh, resonance with the social network. Typically, if you have a slow decay, and in a quantitative way, you have a measure, of course, of the resonance with the social network, which lacks this, uh, this system. So this has been uh, tested in many different ways, but for the sake of time, I just jump. This also, for example, works very nicely for another type of activity, which is uh, in the domain of open source software, where by analyzing um, you know, the database of contributions by developers, where you essentially know um, how up to thousands of developers contribute to build this big cathedral, which is, let's say, Linux, or which is Mozilla, or this big uh, project. You know every identity, you know every line of code, any correction, any debugging. And you can therefore ask what is caused by which a previous activity, and what were due to, let's say, an external piece of information. You can trace this, and we see very similar behavior. Of with exactly the same uh, type of dynamics and evidence for a lot of endogeneity with the same type of parameters. I don't know, I confess, why it's not open 5 and it's open 3, open 4. There is probably a, if you call it physics, a renormalization effect we don't understand. And this uh, now is to come back to finance and to a complement of information that were gathered by this group in Paris around Boucher. I showed you already this slide. I showed you now something that you are familiar by now, listening to me, where a piece of news comes in, the jumps occur almost instantaneously, and other jumps occur with some probability which decays according to this, and you have the uh, exo peaks, which are the probabilities for jumps to occur, conditional of the occurrence of a jump at zero. What is interesting, I was telling you that this one decays much lower than this one, and this is indeed shown by uh, quite um, <coughs> so analysis by this group showing that indeed the relaxation for this curve is on average roughly one, one over time according to the first example it could be one over time to the power one plus theta so the other one plus one but the decay here is much lower is like one over square root of time so again in this piece of work by this group in Paris and evidence that there is a time signature in the response of the system to, let's say, an exogenous piece of work as opposed to more endogenous triggering of past jumps triggering future jumps. So now I want to really ex extract the juice out of this model and out of this concept to understand the dynamics of one of the most spread, arguably maybe the most liquid um, future contract in the US, the e is, which is basically a replica, 
which can be easily traded of the famous SP500 index, right? Which is portfolio of 500 uh, major companies. And these are a few statistics uh, about it. And this is how it looks like. Uh, of in, a, in, a, in a day, you see hours here, and when you blow up this, you see the bid ask, um, the bid ask bounce, famous bid ask bounce, and so on. You see that uh, dynamics, you see move the price, and so on. And the time series that we are going to analyze here to show you a few final results is the times and the triggering between these times, we believe, occurs when the mid ask price change, evolves. For example, here the mid ask price doesn't change, but it may change here and here and here. And we're going to look at this as events occurring along the dynamics. So, for those of you who are not familiar, this is a cartoon way of the order book, where you have on the large price size the uh, orders that have been uh, offered to uh, the, the market, for example, to sell at this price, this amount of stocks, and so on. And they are not relied because they are not finding any counterparty. The counterparty are the buyers who also put orders to buy at the draw price these different quantities. And once in a while, there is a kind of um, annihilation when an external order comes. Let's say a blue order comes here and starts to eat and so on. We look at the dynamics of the middle price, which is a good proxy, not perfect, the good proxy of the dynamics of this system. And we know that there is a lot of complex or interesting behavior. This is a list of status facts that has been documented that I'm not going to do, to go into it. And in particular, when you look at the timestamps of these price moves, there's also a lot of modeling that has been going on. For example, uh, Engel generalized the uh, famous GASH processes into so-called auto regressive condition duration processes, which is writing how the time between two mid-price threat change can be a stochastic variable with a memory uh, so stochastic variable with a memory which takes into account past time realization and past actually effective value of the, uh, this, uh, this, this variable. So it's a kind of generalization in the duration domain. And there are many other models. And the model, of course, I'm going to use is the Oaks process of self-excitation because we understand it a lot. And it is the simplest that takes into account processes of excitation. So we are looking at this, just to uh, remind you, there is an exogenous uh, let's say, influence of new that may give rise to move in the mid-price and maybe previous moves of the, of the mid-price may influence the rate of future price changes, okay? So, uh, <coughs> what we do, we calculate this branching ratio, this uh, critical uh, uh, control parameter, and I remind you that this parameter is also the ratio of endogeneity to the total activity. And we use the various maximum likelihood estimators, so this can be done in explicit form and so on. We have to take into account, and it will be brief necessarily, but we have done how homework, take into account various uh, non uh, season, seasonality effects, for example, the lunch effect, the opening effect, the close effect. You see here the number of mid pie change at the function of time during a typical day with a typical variability over many, many days. This is a more larger broadband view where you look, you look over more than 10 years the uh, activity, the number of big changes, and the volume actually of transaction at the function of time. So we have also issues of stationarity at, your, at larger time scale. So what we do, we actually refrain from trying to understand uh, all dynamics. We, re we only look at dynamics on time scale of 10 to 30 minutes. And we look at all, and we try to understand what is the triggering exogeneity in this window. And of course, coming back to your remark, we necessarily cut the, 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 the past, which means that therefore we have, at least from this contribution, a lower bound of the uh, branching ratio, because it might be that events falling in my window might have been triggered by previous events, but I cannot know it by my calibration. So it's a lower bound from this perspective and so on. Um, we also do residual analysis to show, for example, this is just to give a one illustration of the calibration. When you use a calibration with the Poisson process, which has one memory, the residuals are awful, you reject the model, while with the Hox process, we have very good results with the residual analysis that shows no correlation between the successive um, uh, residuals processes. So it seems that the model has some quality <coughs> in explaining this process. Now, very quickly, some results. 
Here it's showing um, yeah, uh, 12 years time series, uh, showing again the number of uh, mid price move, the volume. This is the price. You can recognize, recognize the, the, here the dot com bubble, the crash, and then the decay, and then the monetary policy of Queenspan and others who push the market up, the risk bubble, and blah blah blah, the crash, the man browser here, and so on. And if here you see blue the volatility, which is also this very intelligent behavior. And these are the results of the calibration of the model, the static cycle model, where we have the average, we average over of 10 windows of 10 minutes, this exogenic component, and you see something which is more or less reflecting maybe the daily volatility also. And we look at the branching ratio, and should, there should be an end here, sorry, and you see the numbers, and we see the trend. And now we have to pause to ponder on this uh, <coughs> result. First result is that the number we obtain from this endogenetic component is not small. Uh, for example, here since 2002-2003 is larger than 50% uh, and is now overrate around 80%, 0.8. Conclusion, if I believe the model, from the lenses of the model, 80% of the mid-price moves are due to past price moves as opposed to due to exogenity or to news. And, the level of, uh, and this is the structure of the uh, exogenity. So, Conclusion, this is not something that has been stationary, but has been apparently growing. The level of endogeneity has been growing over time. The market is more and more reflexive, if you like. More and more. And of course, you can open now the discussion, could it be to algorithmic trading, to high frequency trade, so we may discuss this in, uh, afterwards. Another piece of information, we have extended this to commodities in collaboration with the UCNAD because this uh, United Nations organization is extremely interested in understanding the role of um, securitization of food in a uh, good sense or bad sense of the resonance to the social crisis and so on. So they were very interested, for example, to our estimation that indeed there seems to be a significant endogeneity. You see the numbers, 60%, 60-70%. There's also a tendency to grow over the years. And there's also a tendency, I think I have it here, to resonate with a specific um, behavior. This is an application for oil. You may remember that in the July 2008, oil peaked at $147 a barrel, and then crashed, and then now we are hovering around $100, $110 a barrel, something like this. But around this, there was a big discussion whether it was a bubble, was it inventory, was it China, India, and so on. In our analysis, in our financial crisis observatory, we have the signature of a clear bubble component. Now, what is interesting is that this metric of the Oaks process, the branching process, suggests also that at the micro scale, at the scale of seconds to tens of minutes, we also saw a peak of endogeneity associated with this bubble. So, this is just an observation I can offer. There seems to be bubbles in this old process that develop over years and months here, which has a kind of a replica or mirror effect at the time scale of seven to minutes, measured completely differently by this endogeneity parameter. And uh, you have these different phases associated with different regimes of the branching ratio and, and so on. Last thing I want to show you is much more dramatic events such as the flash crash. Um, so this term became uh, relatively known after, in particular, the event that occurred on 6 May 2010. And this is an account, I think, from uh, yeah, Bloomberg, which uh, shows you the time series. So this is time in hours. And you see that it's a question just of a development over a few minutes that uh, suddenly the market dropped precipitously. And then after a few seconds rebounded and so on. This rebound, by the way, was associated with the stock market closing five seconds, calming everything, resetting the algorithm, and so on. Well, here you have a, a kind of hot potato phenomenon, which has been quite analyzed in the algorithmic trading. So the machines, it was not humans doing this, it was the machines actually imitating themselves and uh, uh, sending massively together until it was stopped by this uh, resetting of five seconds by the stock market. 
So a very natural question is to ask, can we see endogeneity or exogeneity in this, uh, in this crash? Was it exo or was it endo? Uh, or a mixture, okay? And there's a big literature on this, the SEC has made a lot of time to give an official report and so on. So let's look what this model uh, tells us about this. And in order to eliminate the, the, the conclusion, I compare with what we could find at the most comparable event with one distinctive structure. So this was actually closed by in April 27, uh, 2010, where so you see the price. Uh, here there is also a big drop. The volume <coughs> flow is quite significant, comparable, a bit slight, smaller. The total uh, rate of change of uh, so mu is also quite comparable, uh, except here of course the flash crash it was much higher, but for the precursor behavior. But the big difference is in the behavior of the branching ratio. So this event actually was named, looked at, and so on because it was very exceptional. But there is one distinctive signature between the two, which is here the dynamics of the branching ratio, this measure of endogeneity, remains in, in its 95% uh, continuous level. While in the case of the flash crash, we have n skyrocketing to 1. And we know that we get the maximum level of 90, 95%, it's a lower bound, probably n1 over, over 1. And we know because we also can do a lot of synthetics and bootstrap tests that if we generate a process which, has a, which is supercritical, the estimators in general give 1, or branching ratio very close to 1. So, uh, clearly an indication that there was a large level of endogeneity which resonates with this hot potato uh, story that has been done and so on, that we have here a uh, quantitative measure. Um, okay, so, and yeah, something that we are working a lot presently is whether we could have advanced warning. Because if indeed there is endogeneity, you remember the big difference between exo and endogeneity is that in an exo case you have something, you have an event that occurs either up or down, and then you have a response function and so on. But if there is a component of exogeneity, there should be precursory behavior. And there seems to be a little bit of precursory behavior, and we are working on that. And this is supported by our systematic search of crash, flash crash in the market, in the EMINES. And we did the following in order to have two independent statistics. One is to look at the... Uh, so the big question is how do we select the flash crash? This one is famous, has been documented and so on, but how do you do a systematic uh, search? So what we do with the following, it's not perfect, but that's something. What we look, we look at the distribution of drawdowns. Drawdowns, you may remember, are big two valleys losses, so they are not just minute by minute or hour by hour losses or gains, they are taking into account also sometimes transient correlation and they are very relevant for traders because they are the cumulative loss that their portfolio can be exposed to. Uh, you have pride doing this, you are really hurt if you bought here and you sold at the, at the bottom. So looking at these statistics is very relevant as a measure of risk. And when you do this, skipping the details, you find the survival distribution or complementary cumulative distribution function is roughly a parallel for most, I mean, vast majority of the event, and this is normalized or down by the recent volatility. But you have one, two, three, four, maybe five outliers. So there is also a lot of statistics in dealing with whether you prove this outlier, what is the confidence level. I skip this. Uh, by the way, this one is a flash crash I just uh, mentioned, and there are a few others which seem to be dis distinct. Let's check. So what we did was to look at the same exercise, calibrating the uh, time series uh, of price changes, and calculate the branching ratio. And for all of them, the one, two, three, four, in addition to the flash crash, we see the same behavior of an increase, a very significant increase outside the confidence interval of the branching ratio suggesting, indeed, a little bit of endogeneity. Now, of course, you are immediately going to raise the issue that uh, I do cherry-picking, I look at this, and what about the false uh, negative, right? The error of type 2, which means, uh, do I see, in many other cases, the fact that N goes outside is confident band for no reason, when there is no big price? And uh, we are finishing a paper on this, and the results are very uh, optimistic, we don't see that they go out of this band. So what we see, unfortunately, is that we have five extraordinary events of this type for the whole time series that we have analyzed, 
So it's a little bit short to be you know, very confident and have a strong statical behavior, but it is at least enticing that we are after something and now we are um, diversifying by looking at many other time series and systematic, making more systematic research. I think my time is uh, finished, so I should conclude. There's a lot of things we have been doing, so I'm going to pass. We do expectation maximization, we look at non regular um, exogenity component, and so on. So, and I will, I will conclude that. I think I, I try to show you that we can have a systematic quantification of the level of endogeneity or reflexivity, defined in a relatively narrow sense through the deforming lens, obviously, of the oxycephic excited process. However, I think it eliminates uh, a lot of questions, in particular in the time series that I've showed you, earthquake dynamics, uh, social networks, um, you know, contribution on open source software as a proxy of teamwork, and so forth and so on, um, success in, uh, in commerce and so on. It eliminates the, the value of the product, of the process, as well as the relative contribution of uh, let's say, external influences together with the internal organization in a way that may change uh, maybe the diagnostic that we have in the future, at least providing new insight in the process that we can then match to direct observation of the dynamics of the system. So I will not have time to show you the application to many other systems and to and how the franchise accelerator works, but we can do this maybe privately uh, afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.